I'd like to uh, just welcome up here Alex Gray. This is uh, Fran Gray's nephew who spent some time with Roderick and he's going to introduce us to Roderick. Hello, hello. Hello Wellington Square, it's great to be back here again. I've been here many times throughout my life and it always feels like home. So thank you for having us today. And, uh, I'm here today to introduce our special guest, my good friend, Roderick Zalimba. I suppose I've been asked to do this because I had the very good privilege of spending uh, five weeks with Roderick in Malawi. Um, it all kind of happened by accident, but in the Lord's own way. <laughs> um, I was obviously uh, on the mission trip to Malawi with uh, Fran and Maggie. I am Fran Gray's nephew, as some of you know. And I had planned to travel to uh, Tanzania and Kenya after my time in Malawi. And when I met Roderick, uh, my heart was touched. And I felt like I had a friend as soon as I met him. And I saw the wonderful work being done at Prison, Prison Fellowship Malawi with the little resources they had and the wonderful potential for things that could be done there. So I went to Fran and I said, listen, I think I'd really like to change my whole itinerary. I don't really want to keep traveling anymore. I'd like to stay behind and help. But I don't know if that's acceptable, if that's, uh, you know, if Roderick would be willing to take me in or how that would work. It was very last minute. It was probably two days before we were supposed to leave. And thankfully, Roderick welcomed me into his home with his family. And I got to spend a wonderful four weeks living with him in Balaka with his beautiful three children and his wife, Matilda. That experience was a real coming of age uh, experience for me. I learned so much, I saw so much, and throughout the whole time, Roderick was my, my guide, my mentor, my friend, and my pastor. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about him, some things that he might be too modest to talk about <laughs> before he introduces himself. Roderick is the writer of all the music on that DVD um, from which you saw a sample. He is a full-time music director, the executive director of Prison Fellowship, and a huge leader in the community. I once told Aunt Fran that traveling around town with him in the truck was like being with like the coolest kid in school or like a celebrity. We couldn't go very far without stopping because someone wanted to say hi to him. So he's a real leader in the community, a huge presence. People would come to prison fellowship grounds all the time with their problems, with seeking guidance, and whatever Roderick had available, time or otherwise, you would use to help these people. <laughs> he also has a much harder day than any of us here during our work day. Um, I just want to paint a, a bit of a picture for you what life is like on a day-to-day -day basis when you're working in an organization trying to help the forgotten of the forgotten and you live in an infrastructure uh, like one that Malawi has where obstacles and challenges don't seem to stop. Um, when you get up in the day, you're lucky if you have power. That's the first obstacle to turning on the computer. <laughs> if you want to do some work, obviously email correspondence and phone calls are a very important part of coordinating an organization. So if, if uh, there's no electricity on the grounds, you have to go into town. You have to hope that there's an internet cafe that has a generator working. You have to hope that to get to the town, you have enough gas to get there and to travel around. If you need gas, you hope that the gas station closest to you has gas for you to purchase. If you need money, you have to hope that the ATM is either on, has money, or accepts your particular type of card. 
if you want to be on the internet, you have to make sure that your internet dongle is working or that the service provider is working. There's so many small challenges, things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis that just dictate the pace of your day there. And I just want you to get a sense of how hard him and his small staff work to, to get things running. Uh, he'll explain some of the projects that Prison Fellowship has going on, I think. But I just want everyone to appreciate the amount of work that him and his staff do. And thank you for your support. For all those of you who came out to the trivia night a little while ago, thank you. It was a huge amount of support that we were so happy to receive, and I know Prison Fellowship was as well. And I think I've said everything I need to say, so without further ado, please welcome Mr. Roderick Salimba. Good morning, church. Uh, I feel very honored and glad to be here this morning to share my life story. I'm the kind of guy who doesn't normally stand up in church and speak. When I speak, I'm uh, normally speaking in prison where we have inmates, we have officers, we have volunteers. So when I got the opportunity to come up here, I told myself, I'm going to assume I'm speaking in a prison. <laughs> well, uh, speaking about prisons, um, the word prison comes up so many times in the Bible. So many times the Apostle Paul refers to himself as a prisoner in the Lord. We have so many references, and in fact, we can say that we were once in bondage, and because of the name Jesus, we have earned our freedom. So we cannot entirely rule out the association between prison and ourselves, because while we were sinners, Jesus came, died on the cross for you and me, so that we should earn our freedom. So in that realm, I am comfortable to stand in front of you and tell my story. I am glad because it will be the first time that I am telling my story. I normally speak about prisons. I speak about what we do. And uh, very rarely do I get the opportunity to tell about myself. So my story begins some 38 years ago. I was born to a woman called Rose, and a man called Montfort on 10th of June. So yesterday was my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I had the opportunity to celebrate my first ever international birthday right here in Bellington, so thank you. Um, our family lived in a small township called Chilomoni in the, outs uh, in the midst of Blantyre. Blantyre is a small city south of Malawi. And uh, my father worked with uh, a gas company called British Petroleum. Um, my mother did not go to work, so he most of the time, I mean, she spent most of her time working in the fields. I was born in a Catholic family. I was raised a Catholic, and I'm still a Catholic. Um, our early life, my early life growing up, was such a huge struggle in the sense that as we speak today about our journey, our walk with Jesus, there were huge struggles with regard to death, losses in our family. I was born in the year 1979, but at that time I was told I was the second born it was the first born who had been born in the year 1977, was a girl, her name Josephine, died very early, I think a few weeks old, and later on in 1982, my sister Christina was born. She grew up to the age of uh, eight or nine, 
but she also passed on. Um, we had a couple more sisters who were born later on, and uh, likewise, they both died in their early stages of life. In fact, by the year 1988, we were four of us in our family, and uh, I should say we were three of us in our family. With my two sisters and uh, my mother and mother, we went to the village where my mother liked to go to work in the fields. And it so happened that my elder sister, Christina, got sick and uh, she was rushed to the hospital. And uh, while they were still at the hospital, my younger sister, Ruth, also got ill. We don't know what the problem was. And uh, Christina died at the hospital while they were about to ferry her body to the village where we were at. My younger sister was also taken there, and she died too at the hospital. So it's like we had two funerals, two sisters passed away, uh, like in a space of two days, and they were buried the same day. This was a very huge and painful moment in my life because I lost uh, like everything I had. We had uh, a, a little sister back then called Emma, who later on also took ill and uh, she passed away. So by the age of nine, I had lost like four people in my life, including my brother David, who also died later on. So it was uh, a huge loss for me, very painful. But joy came later on because as fate would have it, we had three more brothers who were born into our family. So I was happy again not to be a lone sibling. God uh, gave us uh, my younger brother Thomas, we had Jack, we had Kevin, and we had Elizabeth who was uh, like the last born in the family. So in total, we are supposed to be a total of 10, and we lost five, and five remained, of which I now stand today as a uh, firstborn in the family. So going through such a difficult moment, it really was uh, very tough for my mother and my father, but I am glad that they stayed together. They remained strong in the Lord, trusting and believing in the providence of God, irrespective of the difficult moments they went through, they stayed together. They never blamed God for everything. It was easy for them to say, Lord, why did you let all of this happen? But they trusted in God and kept going in their faith. So I come from that kind of background. Uh, difficult as it may have been, I went through primary school, I went through secondary school, but when I was about to go into secondary school, God appeared to me in a dream, kind of warning me of the things that were to come ahead. I was warned about company. I was warned about association with a group of young people who were kind of wayward. And looking at myself, I did not believe because I was like, okay, um, I know I have not been into any beer drinking. I've not been into any kind of smoking. I've not been into the world. I am okay. I ignored the dream. But as uh, fate would have it, years down the line, I remembered this very well because there were incidents. There was an incident that happened uh, in my fourth year in secondary school. I was so lucky and privileged in that in my four years in secondary school, I was given leadership positions to lead our young Christian students organization. I was a school head boy. I was up there in terms of the leadership hierarchy in the school. But the challenge with me was one foot I was with the Lord and one foot I was with the world. So when it came to things of the Lord, I was first. When it came to things of the world, I was first. I was like on the fence, not knowing which way I was actually going. So I had a passion in singing. I liked to practice with our choir. 
our school choir. So on this particular day, towards uh, our examination period, I actually went out to sing and practice with the choir. There was a group of uh, friends that I liked to hang out with. So they came and they were like, okay, can we go and uh, have some drink and smoke? So by this time I had decided I didn't want to drink, I didn't want to be involved in this thing anymore. I was like, I needed to quit. So I did not go with them. They went and came back. After they came back, they approached me again as, and said, man, you look weird. Why can't you come along and we go and drink? And I said, come on, guys, you, you have just been there. Why do you want me to go with you? So they went, and they came back again the third time, so persistent, and uh, at this point I had to give in. So I went with them. And on the road, I was speaking, unknown to me, but I think it was the spirit. I asked them, why are you so persistent? Why are you leading me down this path of my downfall? None of them responded. I suppose we must have been under the influence of a certain force because when we arrived at this place where we used to drink, no sooner had I touched the bottle of beer, something tragic happened. I took the first sip and then we had cigarettes we shared. Then, all of a sudden, my heart started pounding very fast. Then I was like, okay, what's going on? My friends were scared, and I believe at that, point, at that point I was experiencing some kind of heart attack or something like that because there was so much pain inside me. And uh, my friends, afraid and scared, they actually held me and tried to walk me back to school we were walking back to school, and on the road, I was kind of still struggling because I was half conscious, half awake, half aware of what was happening around me. And in a moment, I started seeing things that my friends could not see. It was a struggle because I was seeing like in visions, and later on, I was kind of scooped from the presence of my friends. There were these giant creatures that were holding me and dragging me away. And at that moment, I knew perhaps my death had come. I was going to die. And I was so scared and terrified because if I had died at that moment, where I was going, there was no hope. So in that moment, I cried, and I cried so loud. I said, I am not for you. I am for the Lord. And it was after this loud cry that I discovered all of a sudden that I was alone all of a sudden. I don't know what happened to these giant creatures which were dragging me away, but I was all alone, of course still in pain, not very much aware of what was happening around me. And I heard at that moment a voice, a thunderous voice saying, you were born to be my servant. In that difficult moment, my friends still took me back to school. Um, I remember them piling me in my bed, still scared of what the school administration would say, because it was not allowed for students to go out and drink. It was not allowed to be involved in drinking like we were doing. So if I was discovered that I had taken some alcohol, I would have to be suspended from school. So they lied to the school headmaster and told him that I had malaria and I was critically ill in need of being taken to the hospital which the school headmaster obliged and uh, took me to the hospital. By the time we were getting to the hospital, I had regained consciousness, and I was aware of what was happening. And my friends told the doctors, too, that I had malaria. And now, now that I was awake, I knew this was going to be the biggest mistake because the doctor was going to administer a drug that was totally wrong, and it would make things worse. So I spoke out and I told the doctors to say, no, this is what had happened. We went out drinking, we went out smoking, and I developed this condition. So they assessed me and treated me accordingly. In fact, um, I was put into a ward where there were 
very critical ill people, seriously ill people, motionless figures, people who had been put there and they could not move a limb. I wondered why I needed to be put in that room because I was not feeling sick anymore. So for one whole night, I stayed in this room where by morning time, there were about four or five corpses that were actually pushed out of the ward. And I wondered if I was going to make it through the night. So I just stayed awake and I was like praying to God to keep me until morning, which I am glad happened. And later on in the morning, I was actually moved to another ward because I was much better than everyone else in that room. So while in this room, I grabbed a Bible. There was an old Bible, dusty. I grabbed it and I was reading. I went into the book of John, John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. There is the story of uh, the adulterous woman who is brought to Jesus. They have found her and they wanted to kill her. They wanted to stone her to death. That was the law. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin anymore. So this was Jesus to me speaking directly. Lord Rick, where are those huge creatures? Where are those people who were dragging you? Where are your friends? Where are your peers? Go and do not sin anymore. So at that point, I cried, and I cried out a lot, and I prayed to God to take me back in as his son, and that I would try always to follow and love him. So that's how I actually came back to the Lord, and I was lucky that although at this point I was not able to write my exams because I was still feeling very weak after I was discharged from hospital, I was unable to go back to school and take my exams, but the following week, I, I mean the following year, I was lucky, uh, I had the opportunity to do so, and I was successful in that I passed my exams and got admission into the university. In our system in Malawi, it is such that if you don't do well at your fourth year in secondary school, um, you may not have the opportunity to enter into the public university, which has the best teachers, but is also cheap. If you uh, do not do well, then your parents have to pay for your education further up. So for me, I was privileged to do exceedingly well and earn admission into the university. I praise God up to this day because of the life-changing moments I went through in my secondary school. Because in my four years in college, I was able to reach out, I was able to minister, I was able to serve the Lord. And I know for a point, for a fact, that if I had not known the Lord in my secondary school, I would not have made it through the university. Obviously, something tragic would have happened. And I know for a fact that the enemy who took away my sisters, who took away my brother, had been following me all the way and that it was Jesus who was protecting me, keeping me alive. It was not about me, it was about Jesus himself. So the first leg of my journey took me through a lot of pain and loss, and in everything, I thank God because it could have been worse. I thank God for uh, what he made out of me. Now, when I left college, I picked a job with uh, the local government, I worked as land officer for about three months, and then there came this opportunity to work with prison fellowship. It came as a, a huge uh, surprise for me because when I made the application, I was invited to go for an interview. And I was told, come at two o'clock, the one who called me told me so. And I came to the office where I was supposed to be interviewed at around 1.30. And at 1.30, I found the interviewing panel was actually parking and leaving. So I asked, what's happening? They said, ah, we are done. We have already made our pick. So I said, okay, but I was told to come at 2 p.m. So the person who received me went and uh, discussed with the guys. And I actually heard them saying, okay, let's just do it as a formality. 
So I went into the interview room, knowing very well that it's a formality. Nothing is going to come out of it. But God used this interview as something because he was actually calling me into service. I was shocked two weeks later when I got a call that I had gotten the job. Um, for me, I had been praying to God to actually give me the type of job that brings me closer to him. And so I thought working with an institution like Prison Fellowship that works with prisoners was a huge opportunity for me to reach out, for me to serve the Lord, for me to stay close to the Lord. It was uh, around this time, in 2006, after I joined Prison Fellowship, that uh, I also got married. I met my beautiful wife, Matilda, and together we have uh, three children, Theodore, who is nine, a boy, Esperanza, who is four, and uh, our last born is Evangelina, who is two, but she turns three in September. Working with Prison Fellowship was quite a challenge because when I joined, um, I was this young man with so much anticipation, so much hope, so many ambitions, very passionate, but I was seeing things from the outside. When I went inside, I got the shock of my life because the very first month they told me, okay, so where are we going to get your salary? I said, what? Uh, the institution was going through very difficult moments. We had donors or projects that were actually coming to an end. So the former executive director had left because he knew there was nothing in the pocket. And I just came in to just grab everything and work with it. So it has been a huge challenge for me, but I am glad that with the support of uh, well wishers, with the support of the church here, small as the donations may seem, we have been able to keep the show going, and uh, to the extent that we have attracted a lot of interest, interest from various people, institutions that have seen the facilities that we are learning, the programs that we are learning to be worth investing in. Maybe if I should just give you a little bit of background, my journey with the Lord has taken me to the doorsteps of many prisons. We have about 30 prisons in Malawi, of which we have uh, 17,000 inmates. And these inmates live in uh, dehumanizing circumstances. They eat once in a day. They live in very congested places. Our prisoners in total are meant to accommodate about 6,000 inmates. And uh, they are congested to accommodate now 17,000 inmates. In terms of sleeping, they are just provided with a blanket and uh, they sleep on the floor. They sleep in lines packed one after the another, I mean one after another, in the night when they are sleeping. When it comes to turning your body, you have to turn as a team. So one will shout from one end, and people will, will be like, okay, so let's turn. And then they will turn like that. When this side is aching, you need to turn again, so they will do it. That's the kind of life people live in. And I think it's not just true for Malawi, but it's true for most of the African countries where I have been. Issues of congestion, issues of the prison conditions are very difficult. So we work in an environment where we see a lot of pain, a lot of struggles, a lot of broken lives, people who actually go to prison because of minor or petty offenses, people who are semi-illiterate, people who are, don't have anyone to represent them in a court of law. I steal someone's God and the police apprehend me. I cannot afford to pay for a lawyer. The government cannot afford to pay for a lawyer, so I myself have to represent myself in a court of law, which is quite difficult. And many people have been convicted because they are not conversant with 
the legal jargon that is used in the courts of law. So we have a system that has incarcerated maybe over 80 people, rather over 80% of uh, inmates who ideally ought to be on the outside. We have many people inside prison who should be outside. And those who have the resources, those who have got the money, can afford to pay for lawyers and their lawyers speak for them, they defend them. They have cases that are protracted, they take too long to be concluded. And it is such kind of an environment where we are working in. And we have seen the hand of the Lord working through such people. We have seen the hand of the Lord working through our programs. And I am glad to be a servant in such kind of a ministry. We have one such beautiful program called the Halfway House, which is a rehabilitation center for released prisoners. And we are glad that as I stand today, we just got a huge grant from the European Union, who have invested over 400,000 euros for the next three years. But for them to be able to see this, it was because the program was active. When other donors pulled out, when other projects expired, Wellington Square Church has been on our side providing us with support. We were training 10 people, we were training five people in tailoring, carpentry, and uh, just recently motor vehicle driving. So because they saw that there was a life, people invested, they have invested. It's a beautiful program which takes off this coming July. We will be training a total of 60 people for the next six months and another 60 in another block of six months next year and so on and so forth. So they will come in five cohorts. A total of 300 people will be trained through the halfway house. I have seen the hand of the Lord. I have come here to tell you that your faith works. I have come here to tell you that the support you provide is helping to heal broken lives back in Africa. I have come to say thank you. Thank you because you have stood with us. My journey, uh, in summary, uh, I can say it reminds me of the text in the Holy Bible, Jeremiah 29, uh, 11, which says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and plans not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God knows every sin of the act, which is our life, and he is the prelate. He knows better the twists and the turns in the story. His plans for us are better and bigger. I do not know what God has said to you today or what he will say to you as you continue in your life journey. But one thing I know is that, among other things, our journey is a call to reach out to the least of these brothers and sisters of Jesus who are in prison. Remember, Jesus was also a prisoner, and that we too were also worse prisoners, liberated because Jesus was arrested, tried, condemned, and executed. That is how much Jesus paid for you and me. And I'm actually wondering how much of our time, energy, and resources we are ready to commit to help restore the lives of the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. My personal journey is a huge testimony to you, I suppose, and I feel privileged that God has called me to work inside prisons. If we go back to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, the Apostle Paul says, Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Because you too are also in the body. So I would want to conclude by inviting all of you to get involved get involved in this beautiful ministry of reaching out to people who are inside prison. I was fascinated when I was part of the Friday night community, which is such a beautiful thing that you have developed in this church. I was happy to interact with the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ whom you have welcomed into your ministry. 
and I want to say keep it up for the heart, the passion that you have shown. The harvest is rich, the laborers are few. If you have time and energy, you are welcome to work with us in the Ministry of Prisons. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. When we listen to someone's story, like Roderick's, it makes us think about our own, doesn't it? And like Roderick, when we face sad and tough situations, do we remain faithful to God? When we stray or make poor choices, do we turn back and say, God, please help me stay close to you? Have we had dreams? Have we had messages sent to us from God, realizing that he is trying to communicate with us? When we get frustrated and feel like giving up, do things happen? Some, does something happen that encourages us to carry on because in some way, big or small, our life and our work is making a difference? As Roderick said, God speaks, God guides, God instructs, God protects. And at the end, he said, God has a plan for us. Jeremiah 29, God has plans for us to prosper, not harm us, to give us a hope and a future. And this plan that God has for us is not all about us but a plan whereby God uses us to help others who need God in their life. And that's what Roderick's <clears throat> work with Prison Fellowship does. It, broken lives are given help, healing, and hope. And there is brokenness. There are needs around us, in front of us continually. And the question is, are we taking advantage of the opportunities we have today. Ephesians 2.10 says, we're God's masterpiece. He's created us new in Jesus Christ so that we can do good things that he's planned for us long ago. We are all created by a great God to do great things for him. Let's pray. Lord God, when we listen to people tell their story, as Roderick has done today, we do look at our lives and we ask ourselves, does our life matter? Do we live in such a way that the world will be glad we did? Is there any way we can alter the course of human suffering? Because there is a chance for all of us to make a difference for you in this hurting world. We pray that we might see the needs you want us to see. We pray that we will react to them in a way that honors you and blesses others by serving them gladly with practical expressions of your holy love. So we're asking today that through your spirit, you will give us the strength and the wisdom that we need to fulfill your plan. And we all know that it's easy to get distracted because Satan would do anything would have us do anything but your work. But again, like Roderick, we pray against anything that pulls us apart from you. And we pray for faithfulness to you. We pray that you continue to bless Roderick's work in Malawi. We pray for justice, transformation of lives. We pray that inmates will receive daily necessities and that they will see that you are indeed with them. We pray for judicial reform for more good news stories, stories that Roderick can tell us, he can tell us many. And we pray for ongoing support for ex-inmates and support to help them keep going on successfully in society in the right time. We're speaking to you now in prayer, oh God. We speak to you, but prayer involves listening too. And we want to listen to your voice. And so as we listen to this next song, in the quiet and in the stillness of this moment, we listen to your voice and we pray that we can hear what you're saying to us this day. Amen. <laughs> 